All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the UNH LGBTQ alumni panel discussion. I'm very honored to be on the call today and very happy to have some great alumni on the discussion as well, too. So today we have Susie Petrowski from the year of 2010, former women's lacrosse player. We have Taylor Jarvis, former women's basketball player, graduated 2003. And we also have Caden O'Day, who is a graduate of 2017 and former equestrian player. And this will be moderated by Cache Owens Velasquez. So Cache, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Awesome, thank you, Jordan. And so happy to be here with you all for this really important um, conversation. I got to spend some time with our three amazing panelists and they're all amazing. So I know they're gonna have some great stuff to share with you all. Um, so I really hope this is an opportunity for you to, to learn maybe something new about this topic. Please feel free to ask our panelists questions. They have a lot of expertise, knowledge and lived experience. Um, and so with that, we'll just go ahead and get started. As Jordan said, my name is Cashie Owens Velasquez. I am the director of the Beauregard Center at UNH, previously the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs and I use she, her, she, her, they, them pronouns. Um, and so we have Susie, Taylor, and Kaden here with us, and I'm just gonna kick it off um, with our first question of, feel free to reintroduce yourself, share your pronouns if you're comfortable, and just tell us about what made you decide to choose UNH of all the universities and all the land, what brought you to UNH, and whoever wants to kick us off and get us started, feel, feel free to hop in. Yeah, I, I'm happy to go. Uh, my name is Susie Petrowski. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, so excited to be part of this panel and to be able to kind of contribute back to this program and UNH and the school that I love so much. So for me, I, I, I played lacrosse and um, I remember, I'm sure many of you do as well, when you kind of are driving onto campus and you're going over the bridge and uh, or the bridges and you're looking around and you just can't believe that you have an opportunity to go to a school as beautiful as UNH. Um, that very much um, was probably one of the, the most kind of resonant factors that contributed for me. And then ultimately, you know, at the time we were really building a program that I, I got to contribute in a really serious way. So I think um, athletics, just kind of being at the highest level and being surrounded by beauty and nature, there's not many other places you get to do that. So for me, uh, there's a little bit of a no brainer in that respect. Sure, definitely. I mean, it is definitely beautiful. It's undeniable. So I do not blame you, especially when you're in that sort of um, transition age starting college. It just all seems so exciting. So I, I could, it totally resonates. Um, Taylor or Kaden, feel free to jump in and share your experience. Sure, I'll go next. Hey, everybody. My name is Taylor Jarvis. Um, I graduated in 2003, which is really, really hard to believe. <laughs> that it's been almost 20 years since I graduated. Um, Cindy can't believe it either. I've seen it in your head, yeah. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live in Stratum, New Hampshire now, so I actually, I moved um, here in July, so I'm really close to UNH, and I'm looking forward to being able to come back to campus and, and see games and spend some time because it's the place that I really, um, I loved so much the four years that I was there. I have a lot of great memories. Um, and the reason that I chose it was in part because of the beauty of the campus and the academics, but also I just felt like it was a great fit for me. Um, my mom told me that when I came back from my official visit, um, she saw it written all over my face, I was gonna go to UNH, that it was the team, um, the coaches, just for the right fit for me. Awesome. That mother intuition is strong, isn't it? Um, it is. And last but certainly not least, Caden. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Caden. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm from the class of 2017. Um, I was on the equestrian team at UNH. Um, and what really drew me to UNH was really the equine program on campus. Um, I knew that I wanted to major in equine studies. I knew that I wanted to be a part of the team right away. Um, and the fact that they had a facility and a barn and horses on campus for us to work with. Um, I really knew that that would give me the opportunity to really emerge myself in the program and get involved in the team there. 
Um, and other than, you know, the, the team and the horses and everything, um, just the atmosphere on campus really brought me in. Um, kind of like how you two were saying, you know, from my first time on campus getting that tour, um, it just really felt like a place that could be a home for me. Um, the atmosphere and the vibes were just really great um, and I felt welcome right away. Um, so between that, um, the horses uh, who were just as much as my team members as my human team members um, and just the, the atmosphere around campus, it, I knew I wanted to, to be at UNH for sure. Awesome. So it definitely sounds like some love at first sight going on. I love how romantic this all is. <laughs> so, so thank you all for sharing. So um, the topic of our panel, of course, is the LGBTQ plus experience at UNH, specifically within athletics. Um, so for our next question, um, for any of you, feel free to talk about as a person who identifies as part of the LGBTQ community, can you talk about how safe or not safe you felt openly sharing your identities with your teammates or um, the UNH wider campus community. All right, I'll go again. We'll just like go in order. Or something like yeah, that. we could round robin it. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, you know, it, it's such an interesting question because I was very much closeted throughout uh, my college career. And in speaking very candidly, I think a, a major part of that certainly was um, me personally coming to terms with how I identified my sexuality, my preferences, all of those things. And, and, you know, we actually talked about this in our pre-call, but um, one thing I think when I was there, so it'll be 11 years next month, um, which is dating myself, but um, I, I'm not sure it was talked about as proactively sexuality or being part of the LGBTQ plus community was not talked about as proactively. And certainly we had a number of people within the community, me including, um, who were either out or not out, but um, it was very much a, a part of our program on the women's lacrosse team. But um, again, I, I'm not sure it was um, a hot topic of conversation and, and very rarely were we kind of presented with resources that could maybe help us in that process. That's not to say it wasn't an accepting environment. Um, I just think, you know, in looking back, we're, we're kids, we're babies at that time. So um, maybe kind of the greatest help as, you know, we progress in this world, in this age, is resources to allow members of the community to know that it is okay, it is normal, you are very much like a lot of other people. So um, that's a little bit of a, a both type of question and an answer rather. Um, but uh, that, that's kind of my, my initial response on that one. Yeah, no, it, it, I think it really touches on how you can be working at, um, through things at an individual level. And then there's sort of structures in place at a systems level, at the university level, athletics level, and they all sort of intersect. So um, thank you for sharing. And Taylor or Caden? Sure, I mean, um, I guess for me, you kind of have to bear in mind the, the time frame. Um, when I was in at UNH, so I, my freshman year was 1999. So, you know, at that time, mm. it just wasn't discussed. I mean, there were people who were been, mm. um, I'd say with mm. regards to my team, it was kind of an open secret that one of our coaches mm. was gay, um, but she never, she never mm. spoke of it um, until really not until my senior year when she and her partner mm. had to have a child and then she came out to the team. So um, I think for myself that, that really impacted um, what it was like for me to come out. I was the first one mm. team, um, who came. Mm. And I mean, I think we all sort of had an intuition that there was a few of us that were thinking about it mm. struggling um, at the same time. And I think for me, it was more of a timing thing. Mm. You know, I was friends with someone mm. who was becoming more than friends and it was obvious to my teammates who I spent so much time with um, you know you can't you can't hide those things from them when you're with each other that much um so it, it was a I master me, hider Taylor I was a master. yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah I mean it so I it was more of a timing thing for me I wasn't like feeling like I had this grand plan that like this was going to be my coming out or anything like that it was more like it just kind of happened and I had the support of 
um, several of my teammates. One of them actually wrote me a card and I still have the card um, that encouraged me to say whatever I needed to say whenever I was ready to say it. Um, but there was definitely a little bit of backlash on the team. And I actually, I've, I've taken a lot of time to reflect on that. And there was, you know, from that point on, it was me. And then soon after there was a few others that came out and there was kind of this dichotomy in the team of people who were out and then people who weren't out. Um, and some of that, I'm not sure exactly what that was about. I think some people on the team were a little bit religious too, and had more conservative beliefs and came from more conservative backgrounds, but um, it definitely impacted the relationships that I had within the team. But the people that I was close to were, I mean, we were really close and we had bonds with their, you know, gay athletes. And that was kind of our circle, but we weren't really part of like the greater university um, LGBTQ community at that point. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we still see some of those similar sort of um, divisions today. And it's just interesting how they persisted over time. And Kaden. See if I can unmute you from my end. Maybe Jordan can. As well. I got it. Sorry oh, there you about go. That, everybody. <laughs> um, well, that's a really great question. Um, I'll start off with kind of sharing my identity. I uh, identify as a transgender man. Um, and when first coming into college um, and really into UNH, I had kind of this plan of um, staying closeted with um, having more of a focus on my riding career. Um, I had really wanted to focus on building a professional career around riding. Um, and there really isn't uh, very much trans representation in the equestrian community. Um, so for me, I came in just wanting to focus on that. Um, but that, that plan of being closeted for me lasted about two to three weeks into my freshman year. Um, and for me, I, I just found that it was more detrimental to my well being to stay in the closet then come out and deal with what some of those consequences may be. Um, so after those couple of weeks, I had come out pretty much in every part of my life um, other than with my team and at the barn um, for those reasons of wanting to become professional and wanting to not have my identity um, cause some backlash with that. Um, there, like I said, there really isn't much representation. So for me, um, it, it was more about finding that, that professionalism. Um, but I think the, part of the reason why I found my experience at UNH to be so accepting is because I had really chosen to surround myself with people who were, I knew were only going to uplift and support me and be in my corner. Um, outside of those circles, those organizations that were uh, really helpful for me, like the Alliance and Trans UNH, um, Outside of that, it wasn't quite as safe of a community. Um, there were situations that came up in the way that, for example, I did have to fight housing for the right to use the bathroom in my dorm room um, or dealing with people finding me on Facebook and sending things that way that were hateful because they had heard my story through the Safe Zones program or things like that, um, that were all, you know, the Safe Zones and Alliance were all things that were great to be a part of. Um, There's definitely some backlash on campus. Um, but for my first year, I did stay closeted to my team um, and around the equine facility in general. Um, but because I was kind of out and out in other aspects of my life, you know, word gets around. Um, so by my sophomore year, it did get to the point where word got around to my coach and some of my teammates. Um, and quite honestly, my coach couldn't have handled the situation any better. And the team ended up being one of uh, my safest places, really. Um, she, my coach, she really went out of her way, you know, to let me know that she had heard about my transition, that she wanted to be a support for me. Uh, she was putting in the effort to use my pronouns, switching from she, her to he, him. Um, when I had changed my name, uh, it was an immediate switch for her. Um, she went out of her way to, you know, stop calling the team by ladies and started calling us riders. Um, things like that. And I think that uh, my coach really setting the tone in such a positive way um, is really what made the difference there for me because the team just followed suit. Um, so it was really great to actually be able to, 
you know, I walked into the situation of the team fearful of ever sharing that part of my identity. Um, and by the time I graduated, they celebrated it. They held fundraisers for trans organizations and I, I couldn't have asked for more from them. Wow, that's, that's so powerful. And just those, um, you know, and their face value, pretty low effort things that your coach did and how yes. big of a difference. Um, and which is an excellent segue to my next question. You all have sort of alluded to the role that friends played, coaches played, um, you know, the wider campus community um, in your journeys, three so different yet similar journeys. Um, so can you talk about why is community important to you? And were you able to find that at UNH? Um, were you wishing for something different? How, how was your community search um, for you during your time here? From an athletic standpoint, I think you um, you walk in and you walk into a ready-made community. You know that you're going to have your team. You know you're got kind of going to have to uh, you're going to have built-in friends. So I think that's incredibly important. And in working through who and what you are, be it your identity, be it who you are attracted to, who you want to end up with in your life. So much of that is very personal. I'll say that while I was in a much different space with regard to my comfort level, I, I mean, when I first came out, I couldn't say I was gay. I couldn't say it out loud. Now I'm like, I'm gay. It's the best part about me. And, you know, and, and funny enough, you know, I got married a year and a half ago and uh, I had a huge contingent of my UNH teammates there. Some of them have, now have wives themselves. Um, so I think that it's, it's way more about, um, the relationships that you develop and what you define as your own community. Now, I will say, um, I maybe found a tighter knit LGBTQ plus community beyond the walls of UNH. But for me, that wasn't what I needed to build my own kind of foundation. Maybe later in life, I wanted to check more of those boxes just to feel, I don't know, it's like you have this secret handshake with people who are part of the LGBTQ plus community that you're like, yeah, we get it. You're watching RuPaul on Friday night, so am I. <laughs> but I, I, I think that um, I'm very proud of the relationships that I've been able to kind of maintain from my time at UNH. And if not for being with it on that field within those walls, I, I wouldn't have some of the closest people in my life. Yeah, definitely. I know um, it's all silence in the Owens Velasquez household when RuPaul's on. So I definitely appreciate that, that reference. Um, so yeah, Taylor, curious about your thoughts around your search for community at UNH and, and you know, what, what left you longing for more and what felt really great to you while you were here? Oh, I think you might be, can't hear you. Okay, Kate, and we'll jump to you and come back to Taylor and hopefully the audio will be up and running. One for three. Okay, yeah. wow, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, um, kind of going off of what I was saying earlier, you know, community is so important, being able to find that place to call home, the people to call your family. I'm personally a huge believer in chosen family um, and that they are just as important and loved as anyone that was blood family to begin with. Um, but just finding those that really value you, who are going to lift you up, that you know if something goes down, that you're there in your corner to support you, to give you a voice, and to hear you out is really the biggest thing. Um, at UNH, I really found that through those organizations I mentioned earlier, you know, Alliance, TransUNH. Um, and uh, others as well. Um, but making sure to find those people are really going to make the bigger difference. Um, if it weren't for those organizations and to find those groups, I'm not sure where, where I would even be now. Um, I think it was because of that that I was able to find my voice as a trans person in general, um, whether that was as an athlete or just as a person. Uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's all about the community that, that you find. And for me, that was through those organizations. Right. Yeah. It can definitely make it or break it. Right. I mean, we all are resilient and um, having our community around us can make it a lot much less effort to be that resilient or um, just pile on. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hopefully we have Taylor. How about now? Can you awesome. Hear we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's so exhausting to lie all the time. Um, it's beyond exhausting to feel like you have to be guarded at all times because you're waiting for someone to ask you an uncomfortable question that might pop up and you're not sure how you're going to answer it. And you might have to, you know, some people in the room might know and some people might not know. And, you know, you, by doing that, you, you put yourself, I think, and, and it takes a while to get there, but you put yourself in a lot of awkward positions <laughs> and um, you're kind of being unfair to yourself uh, uh, by not living your truth. Um, for me, I mean, I have a lot of great friends from UNH and to me, you know, friends are the family that you choose. And I have so many really close friends um, that I've kept in touch with over the years from UNH and then <clears throat> friends that I've, you know, that I've met along the way since UNH that are just really, really close um, that I've always been open with. And, but for me, my challenge was my family. Um, I didn't have a community in my family for, for probably about 10 years. Not that I was rejected from my family, but um, they made it as awkward as possible and as difficult as possible. <laughs> it felt like it at, at times. So I really had to, I really leaned on my friends um, through that period of my life. And, you know, in time things, things get better. Um, you know, some families aren't like mine and, you know, some people aren't as fortunate as, as I was to, to have people kind of turn around and, and realize, you know, how difficult they're making life for you and, and not being supportive of you. So I feel lucky in that way, but I also feel like, you know, I kind of had to earn it and my friends were a huge factor in that. So I think, you know, find those people that you know that you can count on and it doesn't have to just be about LGBTQ issues. It's about anything. Um, because those are the people that see you no matter what, you, no matter if you've done something stupid in a relationship or you got fired from a job, whatever it is, they're seeing you. And I think that's really what you need to be um, in search of with, with, with friends and, and family, you know, they come around. Sometimes they don't, but most of the time they do in my experience, so. Yeah, that's some really, really great advice. Um, <clears throat> you also have, you all three of you talked about sort of like some high highs and some low lows, right? And sort of having really great moments where you're feeling really supported by community and then other moments of feeling worried, anxiety, fear. Um, so I, I really hear the, the peaks and valleys of this experience. So now picture yourself, you're graduating, UNH is behind you, at least temporarily, because we're going to keep pulling you back. Um, so talk to us about your experience after college. What lessons learned at UNH helped you transition from, you know, student athlete to professional in, in the workplace? Great question. As I have progressed in my career, I make no qualms or, or make no attempt to hide the fact that I prefer to hire athletes. Um, I... What I learned being at a division one, very competitive program, there were, there was a lot of adversity within the program at, at the time at various moments. And it taught me how to stand up for what I believe in. It taught me um, how to take responsibility, how to contribute to a team, how to um, be vocal at the right times and listen at others. Uh, I just think that um, the way in which athletes, specifically at a school as competitive and you at UNH, enter the workforce, there is a level of resiliency um, that is instilled in you from a very young age and is only reinforced at the highest level. Which, in my opinion, is you know, well, if you're not, you're not. Most of us aren't going professional in in our selected sports. I don't want to speak for everyone, but um, it certainly has instilled in me some of my. Um, favorite things about myself and my and my greatest strengths undoubtedly awesome I have to say since everybody is um, raving about your very cool job if you want to share a bit about what you're doing now I want a job 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I am the head of women's team sports at Octagon. Octagon is one of the top sports agencies in the world. And um, we represent some of the best female athletes in the world. Um, Simone Biles, Asia Wilson, Ali Raisman. We also have great male athletes like Steph Curry, Giannis, Michael Phelps, Sean White. Um, and what I'm doing is kind of building out our division a bit further and making sure that we have all the same resources for our female female clients as we do our male clients because us women got to secure the bag too. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Thank you for sharing. Taylor. Yeah, I mean, there's, I thought a lot about this question, actually. Um, there's, there's two things that, that really, I think are, are important, at least from my standpoint. The first is do not underestimate what the transition from college to normal life is going to be like for you. Because, I mean, for, for most of us, we've been lifelong athletes. And the reason that you're an athlete at UNH is because you've been performing at a high level that you've, you're, you've focused on it now for your entire life. And now these, you know, these four years that you have in college. And if you're on a team sport, you also have a team around you. And, and that's sort of a part of like your, your identity, yourself, the way that you identify with yourself and, you know, not having that is a big adjustment. Um, and I went through a huge adjustment. I, I would say I was probably depressed for a while, to be honest, um, after college, because I, I didn't know what to do. Suddenly I had to like go to work and be normal and, you know, figure out when I was going to work out by myself and, you know, you don't have anyone there pushing you. You don't have your friends there. Um, you know, you're still in contact with them, but it's just not the same. And, and I found myself in a place where I just kept feeling like it's just not the same for a really long time. Um, and, and you have to kind of figure out what your new thing is going to be, um, because the path may not be clearly like lit for you anymore, the way that it is when you're in grade school, through high school, into college. Um, you, you have to kind of you, you define it now. Um, so that's a big transition. The, the other thing um, is like maintaining a sense of control. Like there's a lot of things that are gonna happen in your life that you're not gonna be able to control. And I had a really tough lesson about this when I was at UNH. Um, my senior year, I was an elected captain and I didn't deserve to be elected captain. Um, I had I think was going through some hard things related to basketball and playing time in my role on the team and um, really struggling around that. And I became negative. Um, and even though, you know, I was always the person everybody went to when they had a problem and, you know, it, I didn't deserve to be captain. Therefore I wasn't elected captain. And that crushed me. It absolutely crushed me. And I, at some point, it wasn't right away, but at some point realized that I was gonna have a horrible senior year if I didn't figure out how I was gonna control that situation and control my way of responding to it. And so that was like the first lesson that I had with, you know, shit's gonna happen that you're not gonna like, and you're not gonna be able to control the way other people view you, a job, a promotion, you know, a relationship or whatever, but you can control the way that you react to it. And playing, um, uh, playing a sport and being at UNH completely prepared me for that because I had a real hard lesson right away in that and feeling that kind of disappointment. Mm, yeah, that's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing. I wanted to add two things. because yeah. One, the transition from portion control. <laughs> you have unlimited food and you're working <sighs> out incessantly and you can't finish every meal with a bowl of cereal that was very difficult for me and, and ice cream and ice cream <laughs> and like pancakes in the middle of the night or something ridiculous and also find something that keeps you competitive yes. it doesn't matter what it is but find something that allows you to be competitive it, get into sales I played tennis with one of my college teammates every week still and we're 30 and 32 years old so that was my other things thanks taylor sorry kate no no those are really good, good two <laughs> tips like some two two tangible things that you can take away from this so thank you um kaden go for it 
Yeah, um, so a lesson that I had learned from my experience as a trans athlete at UNH is that you can still be successful even if you don't fit the mold of what's expected of you. Um, although equestrian sports aren't typically divided by gender, they do tend to be very female dominated. Um, so even when I was in, in college, I had never even heard of another trans equestrian at the time. Um, so that was something that, even though that was something that seemed like a challenge to me, I think it actually became more empowering um, to help kind of create that visibility. So that was kind of the, the main lesson that I took away from my time as an athlete at UNH is that, you know, if, if you're focusing on, on what you're doing, what you're playing, the moves you're making, it, it really shouldn't matter if you fit that mold of what's expected. Um, as far as what I wasn't prepared for uh, leaving UNH, uh, definitely UNH was my queer bubble, if you will. Um, you know, it, it made, really made me get used to having that acceptance and inclusivity around me. So leaving that space and entering the professional world after college was most definitely an adjustment. Um, you know, dealing with discrimination, misgendering, ignorant comments without that type of support system just constantly around you. You know, now I can't leave work and go back to my dorm room full of, you know, 10 of my LGBTQ buddies and just talk about queer issues all night and feel a lot better by the end of it. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit different now. Um, I find myself having to, you know, explain or defend my identity um, without that support in my corner now. Um, and, you know, in the professional world, I'm still out as a trans person. It's not something that I hide or deny, um, but it's also not something I typically bring up in conversation um, in that setting or that I like to draw attention to because you never know the type of reactions that people are going to have to that. Um, and unfortunately, those reactions can oftentimes be unsafe. Um, so being back in that type of environment and, and having those those types of things in the back of your head that when you're surrounded by your community, you don't necessarily have to constantly think about um, was definitely an adjustment. But I do think that my experience as an athlete, as a trans athlete specifically, um, really gave me the confidence in my identity that I didn't have before. And I do think that kind of helped prepare me for the professional world and dealing with similar but different types of, of situations. Right. Yeah. No, this has been really interesting. I mean, I've been very clear that I don't know much about sports, don't know too many athletes and just hearing how athletics is so um, has so informed your identity development for each of you has been really enlightening. So you all sort of started going down this road of advice or tips or strategies to student athletes. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about what you might advise as students are getting ready to graduate, they're getting ready to go out and apply for jobs perhaps, um, you know, what, what are some things that they can look for in terms of this might not be an inclusive environment? Um, you know, what, what would be some tips about how to advocate for themselves and what to look for? First and foremost, I think hit us up. You know, I want to help, especially UNH athletes. I especially want to help LGBTQ plus UNH athletes. So network, network, network. We do not at UNH have a robust alumni network, I, I have felt. So if I can be part of contributing to that and open myself up, um, I'm here, hit me up, I'll help you, especially if you wanna work in sports. Um, as far as looking for places where you can feel safe, um, I, I think that is um, incredibly important. I think identifying places where you can be your most authentic self is very important. I have this like litmus test that I use. I'm a huge sneakerhead. If I can't wear my sneakers in the office, I'm not working there. And I know that seems a little silly and a little rudimentary, but I figure if you're cool with me wearing my kicks and getting fits off, you're going to be cool with a little other parts of my life. And again, that is not applicable for everyone, at least within my sector of the industry. It worked that way. But I think find the things that are your non-negotiables. I need to make sure that they're going to cover my IVF treatment for me and my wife. I need to make sure that I'm going to be recognized as an equal parent. I need to make sure that um, you have groups in place. You're, you have pronouns in your signature. Um, very small things 
that um, can help you identify, is this place going to be inclusive enough for me? And is this place going to be proactive in their approach to inclusivity? Um, and ask those damn questions, especially now, um, HR departments, especially, they need to be on their very best behavior. And that means making sure that everyone feels comfortable working at that particular organization. So hold them accountable. And if when they're held accountable, that doesn't result in an opportunity for you, I promise it's going to be for the better because you do not want to be at a place where you can't be yourself because that shit blows. <laughs> a thousand percent claps <laughs> across the board for that. Um, I, I think that's some really, really good advice that, you know, you may lose out on that job for whatever X reason, but staying employed there for two years, I'd be really miserable and terrible for your mental health. So um, I think that's, that's really good advice. I tend to like a, a shaved head and tattoos. If they're good with that, I think they might be good with <laughs> other things around about me. So I think it's good to sort of pick a couple things that might be your um, like sneaky way of investigating. And, and yeah, it's, it's really smart. Uh, Taylor, any thoughts? Um, two things. I mean, there's knowledge and there's feeling, right? So first of all, you have to be knowledgeable. And well, I, I have to do my lawyer spiel here. It's illegal in most places for, for an employer to discriminate against you based on your sexual identity or your gender identity, so or your sexual orientation. So, but not everywhere. So that's something that you would want to be knowledgeable on. Like if you move to, you know, I don't want to make like sweeping generalizations because I don't know what the law is in Louisiana, but if you're not protected in Louisiana, then there's a pretty good shot that you're going to encounter more of that there because the laws just don't protect you. So, I mean, so no, know that information. I mean, we're very blessed up here in New England to be in this bubble where all of those things are protected. Um, the other thing is how you feel. And, and Susie touched upon this is asking a lot of questions. I mean, when you're in a job interview, you're interviewing them too. They're not just interviewing you. you this is a bilateral thing that you want to make sure that they're a good fit for you. And by you demonstrating that you're, you're showing that you're like, you're showing up, you're fully engaged in, in all of this and you want something too. And if they know that, then they know that you're going to be motivated and that you're in it to win it if, if you're demonstrating that. So ask those kinds of questions and don't be afraid to ask those questions. Once you're in an organization, I mean, well, first of all, most major organizations are going to talk about their diversity inclusion, whether it's on their website or once you're in the employee handbook and stuff like that. So, there's, so if, once you're in an organization, there's a lot of information there that you can look at to help you understand you know, what extra benefits you might have from working there. And then, you know, being knowledgeable about who could actually help you. So, I mean, if you're, you're in a job, you thought you're really going to like it, you had a great feeling, the feeling was wrong, you know, it really sucks and you feel like you can't be yourself. It's, it's being knowledgeable about who can help you in that organization and going to those people, even if that means bypassing your boss. Um, and, and at the end of the day, just because you're, you're gay or transgender or wh however you identify does not mean that you have some social obligation to be that person that's going to be like the change agent. You know, if it's bad for your mental health, get out. It, you know, there's nothing, unless you decide that that's who you want to be and that's what you want to pursue in an organization, you don't, you're not obligated because you identify as something other than straight. So, um, you know, you always have to be sort of aware of like what your threshold is and what you're willing to, to deal with and, and not deal with and, and stick to that because it's not worth it putting yourself through hell mentally. Um, it's just not worth it and you won't be available to other people in your life either and you won't do a good job. Yeah, totally. And I think um, our bandwidth can change, right? You might go in, like, I can, I can really push for policy change. And then maybe after two years, like, I'm really burnt out. I need to step away. And I think there can sometimes be guilt wrapped up in that or yep. um, feeling like you're responsible, kind of what you're saying, Taylor, and to just know, like, those things ebb and flow. Um, so I think that's that's really good advice. Kaden? Yeah, I definitely uh, second everything that you two have already said. 
Um, and I guess what I would add for as far as like advice for student athletes is just know your worth. Um, your identity doesn't determine your ability to play your sport or do your job. Um, but with that, you know, advocate for yourself, find those around you uh, who will be that support in your corner. Um, you know, I've had experiences in the sport where I walk into a facility and I can tell by the way people are looking at me that they're unsure if I really belong there. Um, if I really should be there in the first place, like what's going on? And then they see me ride and now all of a sudden they're talking to me. Now all of a sudden they're including me in what's going on. Um, and they're actually getting to know me not only as an athlete, but as a person too, once they see that, um, which isn't how it should be. And it's easier said than done. Um, but if you don't let those initial reactions affect your performance when you play or in your work, you know, focus on your sport, focus on the game, focus on the moves you're making, your athletic ability, your performance, your talent, that's all going to shine through and speak for itself. And that can make a really big difference too. Yeah, definitely. I, I think Caden gave, when you talk about your coach that you had and the things that they did um, to make you feel more welcome, and Taylor talked a bit about some teammates as well. Um, so I'm wondering if you all can talk about sort of the role that allies have played in your experience. What advice um, do you give to allies? And just, you know, if you could give them a message on what role they play, what would you say? I mean, I think we've all touched on it a little bit. Your chosen family. Chosen family does not all need to be members of the LGBTQ plus community, but they all need to be allies. And I think continue to educate yourself. At this landscape, our landscape is changing. Make sure you are changing with it. I think that's incredibly important. Um, and I think allyship is, um, it can be shown in a number of different ways, right? Like it can be done by way of action. It can be done by way of um, voice. I think it's incredibly important for allies. I, I talk about this sometimes. I'll say, oh, my wife and I were having a baby next month. And the next thing I know, the person on the call is like, I have a gay friend. And it's like, <laughs> nice <laughs> you know and um I, I think if you're an ally try to avoid some of those trappings i'm not going to speak for the whole community but while we appreciate that you have other gay people or trans people in your life um that doesn't make you more of an ally and we don't know all the gays so <laughs> I, I think um just be cognizant of that at, at, from an ally perspective it, it, it again it doesn't ruffle my feathers if anything it's just like a little bit of an eye roll um but yeah it incredibly important we are nothing maybe that's a bit extreme especially when you're in an environment or in a workplace where you are very much the minority more so than when you're surrounded with other members of the lgbtq plus community um make sure those allies know when you need them to help stand up for you um i'm doing right now in my workplace i i'm getting ready to go on parental leave and why is it different with maternity and two moms and all these things and i have many of my straight allies you know helping me through this process and saying, we're advocating for you because you're no less of a mother just because you're not the one carrying. Um, so I think when allies can carry the torch a little bit or advocate on your behalf or be a louder voice in the room so you don't feel like you're the only one, that to me really makes an incredible difference. Yeah, definitely. Taylor? It's so funny what Susie just brought up um, <laughs> because for some reason, my experience has been not, not across the board, I'll say it that way, but many times just because you tell someone that you're gay, they think that maybe that's open season to ask you really personal questions about stuff. Like, I mean, it's like, you know, I appreciate your curiosity <laughs> because that's how you learn, but, you know, don't put somebody, don't put them on the spot and ask um, personal questions that you wouldn't normally ask somebody. And if you're really, if you are really legitimately curious about their, their life experience or what it was like for them to come out or how their family feels about it, um, you know, ask them privately and ask them if it's okay, you know, to, to, if they're willing to go in that level of detail um, instead of just assuming because I'm identifying myself a certain way, like, well, that means you can just ask me whatever, you know, that's not what that means. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sure Caden gets this a lot. Um, and um, um, I just lost, oh, just being, just being normal. I mean, like we're all people, you know what I mean? Like 
uh, yeah, I'm married to a woman, but like we have a normal, we have a house and a yard that we take care of. <laughs> you know what I mean? We have jobs. <laughs> it's no, it's, you know, it, it's, it's the same. It, it's just two people that are the same sex that are in that relationship. So, I mean, I think respecting them by just treating like they're anybody else. Yeah. And never mm-hmm. call it a choice. Also never, ever, ever, ever call it a choice. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one to end on. Kaden. I got the mute button that time. All right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for for me, you know, everybody is going to be a little bit different in what support looks like for them, especially around different identities, right? Um, so, you know, have that conversation with your teammate or your friend or your family member, whoever that LGBTQ plus loved one in your life is and say, hey, what can I do to support you? Like, what do you need from me to be your ally? Um, everyone's going to be a little bit different. So, you know, I'm always a big advocate for if, if that's someone that you care about and you have that type of relationship where you're comfortable asking that question, that's really the best way to know what that person needs. Um, but I also love, you know, pronoun circles, introducing yourself with pronouns, pronouns in your email signature. Um, you know, for athletics, if you have like a beginning of the season event where your veteran players are meeting your new teammates, you know, to your name, your major icebreakers that you're doing, you know, add pronouns, uh, just make that kind of a normalized thing. Um, it should never only be the trans person in the room sharing their pronouns. Everybody has pronouns that they use. Um, so everybody should kind of help normalize that um, and share because we really shouldn't be assuming about everybody. But again, I second what both of you had said. That was just kind of my two cents to throw in. Yeah, yeah. And I think I, I love all the examples that the three of you share because you highlight, I think, the uniqueness in the LGBTQ or queer experience. Uh, not, I like what Kian said that what's going to work for one person isn't going to work for everybody. Um, and so just really asking people what they need since they're the experts in their own experience has always been um, sort of my, my default. And so I really appreciate you all hitting on that. Um, because yeah, we've all had those coworkers, those teammates who like, if they weren't there for us, it would be a lot more miserable, right? And so just the importance of allyship and allyship, not just um, in, in, in a way to be nice and to treat people with kindness, but the more your, your teammates who have marginalized identities feel completely welcome, that's one less thing they're worrying about, right? That's one less thing that could hinder how they perform at that game or stress out at practice. So it ends up helping everybody, um, which I think is, is something that we can forget about sometimes. Um, so, we're getting into our, our last chunk of questions here. Um, thank you so much again to our panelists. This has been great so far. So um, we've talked a lot about things that have really gone well. Um, so let's talk about maybe challenges that remain. So um, we know that homophobia, transphobia, all the obias and the isms remain challenging um, everywhere, but you know, also UNH is not exempt. Um, so what are some ways that um, you would say as former students that we can shift culture here at UNH to be a more inclusive and um, create more safe spaces for LGBTQ athletes? Uh, it's, it's a great question. I think one thing, Kaden, this, this brought something you know, to my mind, but if you get uh, an O-lineman, a huge 6'8 O-lineman who probably very clearly identifies as he, him, leading and saying, this is my, these are my pronouns. It's, it's disarming is maybe not the right word, but it sets a precedent that we're making no assumptions here. So I'm not sure how many coaches we have uh, on this zoom, but that's a great precedent to set. You may very have very obvious pronouns, but that is creating a safe space, providing resources, talking about your girlfriend, your boyfriend in that instance, how you identify discussing Um, Maybe things you don't know. I think making it more regular, more normalized, part of the reason why I lead many of my calls from a working standpoint with, oh yeah, my wife and I are expecting a baby or it normalizes it. And I have put myself in a position that I feel comfortable answering those questions, even sometimes when they are uncomfortable (laughs) because uh, I want to be an advocate. That is my 
whatever to bear. Um, but I think at UNH, again, there was certainly um, a lack of information, a lack of discussion and a lack of normalization. And again, I graduated 11 years ago. I, I am not sure and I'm hopeful that that's not the case, but the more people in positions of authority can create an environment where it is just as normal as the straight members of the team, um, the better everyone is going to be for it. So I think sometimes, um, you know, Caden, you talked about really searching for those communities and resources. Not everyone is that proactive, you know? So I think you were lucky to find that community and you made sure you found it because you needed it. Um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I think um, it's incredibly important to know, again, you are dealing with kids. I think about what I was like between 18 and 22, and I sure as shit was not the person that I am now. So knowing what you're dealing with, knowing your audience and trying to make their lives just hair easier because it's hard. It is hard figuring this out. It is difficult. So the more normalization, the more inclusivity, even within your small circles, the better. I mean, I think that the athletics department could be more proactive, maybe in the recruiting literature. And I mean, just from a very like practical standpoint is putting it out there. It doesn't matter what sport you're talking about that a portion of the recruiting literature contains information about this issue and how it is a safe space and how UNH is a welcoming place. Because, you know, many kids who are being recruited, maybe they know that they're gay, maybe maybe they don't, but maybe just seeing that might say to them, oh, like, well, maybe I should go there. I mean, for someone who might be struggling with it in high school, that might be the tipping point for them to want to come to UNH because, you know, we're, we're putting it out there proactively that our athletics department supports it. Um, I think banning certain words that have um, a sexual connotation as like a to um, that are a degrading connotation um, is, you know, teams committing that they're not going to use certain slang words that, you know, maybe when you say it in the moment, you're frustrated. Um, that's not really what you mean to say, but it's a word that has kind of morphed into something different, um, but it has a really negative um, connotation for some people. I think, you know, making a decision that those words aren't don't have a place anymore and, and sticking by that is another thing. And just leading by example, I mean, um, you know, for me, as I said earlier, it, it was an open secret that, that my coach was gay. And, you know, that could have profoundly, if that was talked about, it just wasn't talked about. And I don't know what it's like any, anymore. I mean, this was a, a long time ago, but I, I still think that um, there's a lot, not very many out coaches, especially at the division one level. And, you know, it, it's, it's not your obligation to be out, but I think if you're, if you're closing the door on, on your life, you're not, you're not creating that open door atmosphere and that family atmosphere that helps. I mean, th they're kids in college, you know, that you're coming here it's your first time away and feeling like you have a support network of people that are, that are open to you. So you can be open back. And so I think that leadership really is something that that is is key um, to, to making the environment better for for student athletes. Great. Yeah, that's really powerful. Caden. <clears throat> yeah, I think that this would be a great opportunity for a shameless plug for the UNH Safe Zones program. <laughs> uh, coaches, captains, leadership, you know, if you can utilize that program with your teams and your departments, it's such a great educational experience um, to hear from different members of the community. There's a variety of programs and panels that they offer. Um, so one, you know, it provides that education around what are these identities? How can we be allies to people of this community? But it also will help kind of normalize conversation around these topics with your groups or your teams. Um, and just kind of build the conversation around that. So it, it's not just a conversation around, oh, this one team member came out and it's all spotlight on that person. It's just a normal conversation to have in everyday life. Um, so I think, you know, between that and the education, I think, I think that's a really great thing that you could do to help support your teams as well. Yeah. So I think what's really interesting is the intersectionality of 
all experiences, but, um, you know, we're talking about the LGBTQ experience tonight. So um, it's it's one thing to be a, a queer cisgender woman. It's one thing to be a queer trans man, et cetera. So um, I think one thing that we've seen at UNH is that male identified students um, don't come out as often as women identified athletes. And, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons of why that might be, um, what barriers might exist, but just curious with your own experiences as, as a student athlete and now in the working world, do any of you have reflections about why that might be and what can we do at UNH to support them? Uh, it's, it's a great question. I think a general toxic masculinity, <laughs> um, especially within incredibly competitive sport. I work within the sports industry and I work with many female athletes, some of whom identify as gay. We have a trans athlete in the WNBA as well as within the NWSL. Um, I don't think there's a single out gay NFL player, which like we all know ain't the case. Um, so yeah, I think that there's a general air of, of masculinity that comes with being an athlete. I, I don't want to speak completely to that experience because I don't identify as a gay man. Um, but I have a belief that that is part of the contributing factor. And when you are an athlete, you are perceived to be very macho. And of course you're going to like women. Um, so again, I think continuing to normalize, you know, I hope my, my nieces, uh, you know, when they tell me they have a crush, I'm like, Oh, is it a boy or a girl? And, you know, we're about to have a baby and, you know, I have books with a lot of different representation. This kid's going to grow up to know that um, there people are different colors, people are different backgrounds, people love differently, and not everything is what you see as uniform. So I think the more we can create an environment where all is okay, and there's no standard, the better. And I think it's really difficult within the athletics community, but I'm hopeful that's starting to change. And I certainly am advocating it for at the professional level. Yeah, I mean, honestly, this is tough for me to answer because, you know, I'm, I'm not a gay man and, and I can't even imagine how hard that must be if you're a gay male athlete, um, particularly in some sports. I, I mean, I think Susie already touched upon some of it. It's, it's um, leadership. You know, if you've got this gigantic offensive lineman that's willing to, you know, use pronouns and identify his own pronouns that others will follow. And I think, you know, some of it maybe is identifying some really strong leaders um, in the male athletic community at UNH that can do that, that, that can play that role and are okay with being a little bit vulnerable in that way and are, and are strong enough to deal with that within their teams. Because I think that's really where that starts. It's kind of more of a grassroots thing. You're, you're not going to I don't think there's a policy change that's that's going to to get anybody any further in that regard. I think it really starts with leadership within the team. Sure, and the environment we create definitely, and Caden. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I definitely second that as well. Um, you know, normalizing the discussion um, and kind of going from there could definitely be beneficial from that. Um, I can't really speak on the experience of a cisgender man. Um, because I'm not one, um, but speaking on my own experience as a trans man, I know that for me, I went through a period of really feeling like I had to prove my masculinity in order to not only, you know, prove my identity, but prove my existence as a trans person in the world and be seen as the person who I actually was. So I feel like I can kind of relate in that way. Um, but, you know, when you have the, the context of athletics thrown in there and what it society thinks is meant to be manly or masculine. Um, I, I think that really has something to do with it too, you know, feeling like you have to prove yourself, prove your masculinity, prove that you're the best. Um, and it, it can be hard to kind of navigate that for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I really hope that we um, are able to make progress in this area and see 
hopefully at least a couple um, gay male athletes, cis athletes um, be vocal and feel safe. That would be really exciting um, to have them to have them out and open on our campus. So, so I wanna wrap up um, at least this portion before we open it up for questions to the audience on some sort of um, aspirational ending. So maybe reflect on who is making the greatest advancements in the LGBTQ plus athletic community? Who's really inspiring you? Is there something being done at a university or on a team that you think is really cool. Um, just sharing anything that sort of got you excited these days. I touched on it a little bit, but um, we have trans representation in the highest level of competition for um, the NWSL and the WNBA. I think that's incredibly important, especially when trans rights are being attacked in the way in which they are, especially from our political climate. And representation is so very important um, across the board. So I am excited for increased elevation of marginalized voices. And I often say within the industry that I work, I wanna leave this industry blacker, browner, gayer, more female, more expect accepting of the trans community, more Asian, whatever it might be. And if I can have a role in that, great. But I think it's incumbent upon everybody in whatever industry you work in to make sure that when you look around the room, that there is representatives that look like the world around you. And I think that's what everyone can do. I, I was putting together a meeting and I said, we don't have one single Asian person on this call. That's a mistake. We have one black person on that call. That's a mistake. There's eight white people, you know? So be cognizant of that. That's what allyship looks like. And, and I, I just wanted to touch on, obviously UNH is not the most diverse institution in the world. So you have to work hard. And I think most diversity exists within the athletic department. So make sure that that is made a priority and make sure that representation exists. That's what gets me excited because when I turn on the TV, when I go on YouTube, when I'm scrolling on Instagram, whatever it is, I see a lot more people that look like me, sound like me that I can relate to. And I'm pretty palatable with regard to the LGBTQ plus community. So um, making sure that that representation, representation exists is like, that's what's up. Um, well, for me, I'm, I'm really proud to say that it's a fellow alumni, uh, to me, that's making a huge change. Um, one of my former teammates and best friends on the planet, I don't know if she, she joined the call. She, I think she had uh, team meetings, but her name's Colleen Mullen and she's the head coach at university of Albany. So for the women's basketball team, I'm sure you guys know Colleen Mullen. Um, and she was one of two openly gay division one coaches in, in a, a major division one sport. Um, and actually, if you Google her, there's um, a New York Times article written on, on her and her wife, and they were both coaches and they had to make some difficult decisions about, you know, whose job eventually would take priority and they have three kids. And, you know, she's groundbreaking by being herself and being okay with being herself and putting it out there and not being ashamed and, and being fearless about it. And, um, you know, I have a, a huge amount of respect for her because of that. And in fact, you know, she posted this on Facebook. It was a couple of years ago where this article came out and I had no idea um, that, that this was true. And I thought, how could this be true? I mean, it was like 2019. How could it be possible that Colleen Mullen is the only open gay division one coach and so, and that was only a couple of years ago and, you know, and it's changed even since then. So, I mean, it's people like that that are just willing to put themselves out there and be themselves um, and be authentic that are, that are making the change. And that doesn't have to be on a grand level. It can be just day to day, you know, in your workplace, if you're comfortable being out um, with your team, with your family, because that, that is what will normalize it, is that people are constantly being confronted with it and seeing how normal it is and how normal your life is. Right. Uh, for me, uh, Chris Moisier is somebody that comes to mind. Um, he is a transgender Olympian triathlete. 
Um, he works really hard to advocate for trans athletes' rights to not only play their sport, but to play on a team that reflects their identities as well. Um, trans youth, especially right now, are being targeted around the country, um, being told that they can't play on the appropriate team that they feel comfortable with. Um, and some of those bills go as far as having players prove their anatomy to be on certain teams. Um, and for a lot of trans youth, this can be one of the first major cases of discrimination that they deal with growing up as trans. Um, and it, working with trans youth myself, like I've seen the effect that it can really have um, on these kids and my own experience growing up as well, um, facing that it, it's hard and it sets, it sets you up to, to be down on yourself if you don't have the right support in your corner. Um, so I really admire the work that he does to ensure that we are on track for everyone's right to play their sport, but also play on the team that reflects their identities that they're going to be most comfortable with. Um, you know, he, he speaks, he uh, works on the legislature around uh, discrimination protection and things like that. Um, definitely check out his work. He's a fantastic advocate for the trans community. Yeah, which so needed right now, right? As um, Susie mentioned, Kaden mentioned that um, policy is being pushed at several levels of government that would be really, really harming to the trans community, specifically trans athletes. So it's really good to know that there's people out there who are fighting the good fight. Um, so with that, those are the, um, the end of our prepared questions, but I want to be sure to open it up to the audience who has been um, so patiently listening and hopefully you've been writing down some great notes, um, notes and questions for our panelists. So maybe um, throw them in the chat or feel free to use the raise your hand function um, if you'd like to unmute and ask um, questions of open to any of the panelists or if you have specific questions for a specific panelist, that's great too. I think they've proven they're not too scary, so don't be shy. <laughs> I'm curious, um, while people are, are warming up and getting brave, what are some of the UNH traditions, whether in athletics or just on the campus more broadly that you really loved or like really enjoyed when you were a student here um, that you think of fondly when you're reminiscing? Halloween. <laughs> Got it. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm probably the one person who has zero clue because I'm new to UNH so but maybe I, I, I can find that out later. <laughs> this is like I, I feel like UNH goes ham. I, I'm sure every college campus does, but I, I don't remember many uh remember many Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's an address. It's 48 Madbury Road. Yeah. <laughs> I love all I that. advise that you wear a helmet, hard hat, goggles. If you're going to go there, you should probably be protected for sure. <laughs> gotcha. First thing that came to my mind was it's a great day to be a wildcat. <laughs> <laughs> I still hear that often. <clears throat> Any questions from the audience for our panelists while we have them here for a few more minutes? Um, Ava. Go for it. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for coming. I uh, really appreciated it so far. Um, I am on a, I'm on the uh, Committee of Mutual Respect, the student athlete version, and I'm part of the LGBTQ um, plus committee. Um, I have to jump off. I have to actually have to teach a class here in two minutes, but some of my other committee members are on here. Uh, what would be some kind of tangible things that we could do, whether it's like like legislature within the athletic department or like different events we could run like do you guys have any ideas like I know you guys spit out a few earlier that we have already kind of talked about a little bit but just anything else that comes to mind um if somebody else in the committee could write those down throw them in our group chat that'd be great and thank you again guys really appreciate it thanks so much Ava Any thoughts on um, some tips for students if they want to jump in and do something? Where where would they start or where would they continue? Is there a panel like this within the student athlete 
community where people can just, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, I think sometimes the problem is that it's, if, it, if it's really formal, people get scared, you know, and that you can sit down and just talk what Caden said earlier is that when he was feeling really kind of down on himself to be able to, you know, have people that he could talk to, you know, and I think that's something that, you know, the three of us have all, have all shared is that being able to have informal conversations, not panel discussions, but like have informal conversations with people, you know, that are going through the same thing. They're athletes. That's a, a whole other thing that maybe other students can't identify with. And then you add that other layer on top of it. Um, because that's something that goes on now. I, I agree. I think I probably would have been hesitant to look outside of the athletic department for a community. Um, just because like I genuinely identify, like I am a lacrosse player. I think that's how I identified. Right. So for me, if there was an opportunity to be with just other LGBTQ plus members of the athletic community, I think that would open a ton of doors. Watch RuPaul on Fridays, go to a protest. Um, I, I think those are really cool ways because there is this like unspoken thing, I think within athletes on campus, you just feel like they get you, they get your experience. So to be able to then align that with the other things that define you, even if you don't have it totally figured out, I think would be super, super influential. The other thing that I just wanted to say are trans rights are human rights and everything that Kaden was talking about. I want you guys to like internalize for a second. Imagine if someone asked you to show them your genitalia to justify playing a sport or participating in something. Think about that, put yourself in that moment. That's fucking insane. And we right now are at this incredibly pivotal point, especially for our trans brothers and sisters, our non-binary brothers and sisters. And we have privilege, I have privilege. I am a gay white woman, but again, I'm palatable. And I am going to use my privilege every single day to make sure people of color are put in a higher regard and the trans community is respected as they should be. So I just wanted to like say that because it, it is an everyone problem and I get like goosebumps and very hot under the collar and I'll get on my soapbox. So I'll step off. But if anybody leaves with anything, it's that. Awesome. Yeah, I, I really appreciate all of that. And like, if there's one message of the night, I think that's a great one to, <laughs> to leave with. Um, so Can I question. ask you another question? Oh, Kesha? Yep. I'm just Go wondering, because, you know, I've been thinking about male athletes in particular, gay male athletes. And then, I mean, I think this, it, it, both way, it works for men and women, but is there a resource that, like a, a person that they, that the athletes know that they can go to if you're dealing with a, an issue, like your, your coach, you're having issues with your coach related to this, a teammate, there's inter-team relational things going on that make you uncomfortable or that are difficult or that are causing, you know, hardship in the team? Like, is there a safe place to go where you can just air that out? Because I mean, this, I feel like some of what I experienced was like, there's a burden that you kind of carry with you that like, you're the only one, or there's this few people that kind of share in this experience. And like, if you're having a problem, there's nowhere to go and feel like there might not be, there's no position of authority to go to and feel like there might not be, there might be a, re, a repercussion if you give them inf certain information. Right. And I think that could be freeing for some people to say like, hey, you know, this guy in the locker room keeps using this word and it, and it makes me uncomfortable. And this is why it makes me uncomfortable. And it doesn't mean that that person has to out themselves, but at least they have somewhere to go where they know it's confidential and they have a place to put it instead of just carrying it all the time. Right. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. And I think um, within athletics, I'm not too sure internally, Jordan, or maybe someone else can pop on and share. But um, in theory, the Beauregard Center, which is the office where I work, is that place for a lot of students. Um, we, we don't have a ton of student athletes who hang out in the space very, very on a regular basis. And I think it's because they have 
um, their community that they feel comfortable with in athletics and um, they don't necessarily find a need for the Beauregard Center. Um, but that is definitely the way that we are utilized by a lot of students outside of athletics, but within athletics, I'm not too sure. Jordan, do you have anything to add? Sure, uh, I would say our first resource um, well, one of our resources has been the Beauregard Center and it's been packed as well too for different resources or different issues, I should say. And we also have a, a new support group called Athletes Supporting Athletes where we just started this, this, this past year actually. So we're trying to find some solutions and some safe zones within athletics for student athletes to speak to each other and just basically have that, that space where they can be themselves and just talk about issues that are truly affecting them. So that is something that we have noticed in the past and that we're trying to work on right now. Yeah, definitely. I think it's an area that my office and athletics is excited to collaborate on. And we've been, you know, having conversations about that, um, about how to sort of bridge that gap. So I think that's a really important point that you brought up, Taylor. Um, so there's a question in the chat um, that I am really excited for um, y'all to answer is, what is the Q in LGBTQ plus? Um, I thought it was maybe queer, but I, I was under the impression that wasn't appropriate. Um, and so can folks talk about maybe their relationship with the word queer, because I think it's different for a lot of queer folks. <laughs> I actually identify as gay and queer. And if I have to, I say lesbian um, for, I don't know why uh, it's just what feels right for me. And I personally, me, I like the word queer. I like identifying as queer because it doesn't feel as pigeonholy. <laughs> I don't think that's a word, but I'm going to stick with it. Um, and, and I like the uh, broader inclusive nature of that word because it allows people to um, remain fluid. And at least that's certainly been the case for me. And, and I, I really like the, um, the latitude I get with that word. Right. Any other thoughts on that? Taylor, go for it. I mean, I don't know that I'd be the one to <laughs> answer this question. Oh, sorry. I thought I saw you. No, unmute. I, no, no. I mean, I, I mean, that's what I wanted to say is that I've never I, identified as queer, just as gay. And it's, to be honest, I'm not all that interested in like in the labels. So I guess that's why it doesn't resonate with me that much that that word. And I think, you know, years ago when I first came out, queer had a negative connotation to it. I know it doesn't anymore, but it, it did. So I think that's probably why it never occurred to me to identify that way. But I just don't I just don't really identify anyway. Like sure, I just sure. I don't like the labels. No, that makes sense. Kaden, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I do also identify as queer. Um, and for me, you know, because again, every everybody, everybody's gonna be a little bit different in what each word means to them. So even if we use the same word, our experiences with that are gonna be different. Um, but for me, queer is just kind of the essence of my being, if you will. Um, it's it's less about my sexuality or who I'm attracted to. And for me, it's just more of who I am as a person and how I express myself, um, which I know if, if you don't have the experience of being queer, that might be difficult to kind of understand. Um, and it's kind of hard to really put words to that, but really it's, it's a label that for me feels a little bit more fluid and less in a box as one term or the other. Um, and it also just kind of gives me that freedom and empowerment of reclaiming a word that we know has been and sometimes is still used as, in a derogatory way. Um, but for me and the way that I use it, it's a, it's a very positive thing. But you know, another thing, you know, ask, ask people what words they prefer to use for themselves. If somebody tells you they don't like to use that word, don't use it. Um, for me, you're, you, go ahead, say I'm queer, I, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I um, will pipe in that. I um, loved what you all said about everybody has different relationships with that word. It's gonna mean a lot of different things to everybody. Um, I think the point about see, that Susie made about identifying as gay or queer rather than lesbian really resonated with me. I'm married to a woman, but I don't identify as a lesbian. Um, and so as soon as people hear that about me, that I'm married to a woman, they sort of ascribe like, oh, Cache is a lesbian. And it's not really how I identify myself. So it always feels a little bit strange. And so I would echo what um, Kaden says 
is about just asking folks, you know, how do you identify as so I know, um, you know, how to refer to you. And I think most of the time people will, you know, share or they'll just tell you they're uncomfortable and then you can just move on. So um, that's sort of been how I've approached it. But I know there's also um, generational differences around the word queer um, because it did have that, has that negative connotation that has sort of been reclaimed and um, has sort of evolved to mean new and exciting things as Kaden was sort of talking about. And um, so I think that it's a valid question because that term is always sort of evolving. Um, so we have another question in the chat. Um, are you aware of any resources that allies should look into? Um, I'll add aspiring allies because I think we can always learn. So whether that's books, movies, people that they should be following, um, any suggestions? I'll help put together a list. You should follow Susie. You have a, I'm sure you have Twitter and all that, yeah. <laughs> Just go to Susie for all, for all your names. <laughs> Um, that's a good one. I, I'm, sh I have a lot, but, um, as far as like watching things, um, things that like represent the, the queer LGBTQ plus community. Well, I think like, if you're going to watch like a period lesbian drama, like that, that ain't it. Like that's what we get as examples. Um, and look for your, you know, LGBTQ plus friends to, to give you say, Hey, this is what I like. You know, I, I've said RuPaul like six times probably because it was like the finale on Friday, but, um, uh, it's a little like funny, but I, I don't know. I, I know it brings together a lot of people within the community. Um, but I'll have to put together some resources. I feel like Caden's going to rock this question a little <laughs> better than me. Uh, I also think one other thing, um, as an ally, I oftentimes people mess up like the letters and the acronym and they're like LG plus, ah, whatever, whatever. Don't do that. If you mess it up, that's okay. It's a lot of letters. If you're not saying it every day, it can, you can get tongue tied. Just be like, what are those? Can you uh, help me understand what those stand for? Or why is there a plus? I know that, you know, people jokingly say like the alphabet mafia and stuff like that. Like if you're queer, maybe you can say that, but if you're not, don't say it. That is really good advice. Thank you. <laughs> Any other um, suggestions on resources, either Kaden or Taylor, feel free to jump in. Um, I also would be happy to put together a list um, as, as I can come up with them, um, but one that specifically comes to mind for me um, is the documentary on Netflix, Disclosure, uh, that's hosted by Laverne Cox. It's around trans representation in the media, but definitely, definitely could be applied to pretty much representation of trans people anywhere <laughs> in life um, in the way that she talks about it and the way that different people in that documentary talk about their experiences um, with representation. Um, that is definitely a really good one to check out if you're looking um, to see how representation has changed over the years in the trans community. Um, as well as the impact different types of representation has had on the community as well. Isn't there another one? I know I watched it and I forgot the name that is like the broader LGBTQ plus community. I watched, I know I, the-, the I think there is. is. There's another one. Apple TV is kind of crushing it. So <laughs> I can't remember the name, but look at it. Yeah, there's a lot of great documentaries out there, particularly ones that are made by queer people. Um, so yeah, Laverne Cox is just a general, goddess, but oh, um, yes. highly suggest um, that film as well would echo Caden. I mean, I think a central theme of allyship is empathy. So, I mean, anything that you can do by reading, like, in, you know, there's not a million, but there's a lot of autobiographical stories now that have been written by people who have shared their experience of coming out in their life you know, Ellen, Brandy Carlisle just put out a, a book called Broken Horses that my wife is reading and she said it's it's awesome. So, I mean, I think the more you can do that and kind of get in touch with people's real life stories and what they've experienced and the more empathetic you can become to what it's like to, you know, to be trans or to be queer. I'm going to start identifying as queer now that you've, you've really, you've opened my mind. Uh, <laughs> um so yeah, I think that's anything that you can do doesn't have to be like policy driven. It can just be about someone's experience. Right. I think it's important also to like make sure what you're watching. I oftentimes feel like the central theme of the gay character is like them struggling with their identity and watch things that like, it's just part of it. Like, oh, they're gay. 
Like that is literally the least defining thing about them in the show or the movie. Find those because that's a whole lot more realistic as opposed to like, I'm, yes, we all go through challenges, but you know, now we're all just kind of living our lives. You know what Taylor said? Right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> which, is a, work, right? which, <laughs> which is an amazing segue. You must be psychic into, I think what will be our last question in the chat. Um, folks are curious if you're comfortable sharing about your coming out story, um, whether it was before, during, after UNH, um, and definitely do not feel obligated to answer this question. I know it's a deeply personal experience um, and you know you can share bits and leave parts out, but if anyone's interested in taking on that question. Yeah, I came out two weeks before I graduated to my family um, because at the time my, my roommate, classic, my roommate was my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my family was very surprised and my mom in particular had a very difficult time with it. It was a little bit of a different time. Um, and then, you know, I kind of started to tell a few people that I was close to friends wise. Um, I was a master at hiding it, even with my teammates. Um, so a lot of people were very surprised and for what it's worth, while it was challenging, you know, with my mom and my family a little bit at the beginning, it was kind of a lack of education and I can very proudly and gladly say that, you know, I had a, my wedding, you know, last August and it was incredible. My brother officiated it. My dad walked me down the aisle and it was the best day of my life. And I'm welcoming a child and my life's pretty, you know, <laughs> normal, you know, so as they say, it does get better. And, and if again, your family has challenges with it, they do continue to educate them. They start to come around. Um, and if they don't, chosen family it up, baby. You got a lot of people that love you, no doubt. Yeah, I came out when I was 19. Um, so it was my sophomore year at UNH, 2001. It's a good year. Um, <laughs> it's a long time ago. And it, I, I can't, I mean, I spoke about my experience with the team earlier, which you know, for, for those of us who were very close knit was, was very supportive. Um, my family, not so much. And, you know, it was, it was tough because I feel like I spent a large part of the next 10 years of my life proving my worth, you know, and, and being the best at everything that I could be and, and choosing all the things that you're supposed to do and, you know, having the right career and getting the right graduate degree and, um, you know, and I'm not sure I did all that for me, to be honest. Um, and I, that's a lesson that I that I learned um, is that you have to, you know, part of it is you have to love yourself. And um, there was definitely some stuff that happened in that 10 year period. I was not loving myself for sure. Um, so, you know, that was a hard period. But, you know, my family came around. I, I too, am a master of disguise um, and feel like... <laughs> You know, I enjoy just my own representation of myself, I think, is feminine. And that is a more palatable version of being gay. And Susie's talked about this, too. And I think that's a privilege. I've enjoyed that privilege um, in my career. I've enjoyed that privilege at times. Um, I'm an attorney. And um, for as progressive as you think that that profession should be, because, you know, we sue people and win civil rights cases and, and stuff like that. It's a very sexualized profession and how you look means a lot. And people are, are looking at you and men want you to look nice and they'll work with you if you look nice and women don't want you to look nice because now you're a threat. So then you add that you're gay in the mix of all that and nobody knows what to do with you. Uh, you're like a unicorn, <laughs> you know? So it was tough. I, I would say it was tough, but um, I learned a lot about just how to be myself and, um, you know, people do come around and the ones that don't, they're out. I, there's just, there's no need to keep them around. Yeah. Kaden, anything that you'd like to share? Yeah. So I feel as though coming out is something that happens continuously. Uh, you know, I, the first time I came out, I was in high school, I was 16 years old. And I also came out two days ago to a coworker. 
um, and a million times in between then. Um, but one coming out story I'd really love to share was the first time I came out at UNH. Um, like I said earlier, like I came in with this plan to be closeted. I was gonna focus on my writing career. Two to three weeks later, not gonna happen, had to come out. Um, so I first came out to my roommate and a couple of friends that were in the dorm room next to us. Um, I was really lucky that they, they were pretty um, supportive and accepting. Uh, they might have not totally gotten it 100%, but they, they were willing to help me out. Um, so that exact day, we took the bus to Walmart. We went to the party section and we bought It's a Boy plates and napkins and balloons. And we got a cake that said It's a Boy and invitations. Um, and we set up like this little party in like the little common area in the dorm room. Um, and we put invitations on every door. Like we bought so many packs of invitations. This was in I think it's now called like Holland Hall or something like that. It used to be called something different, but there, there was a lot of rooms in there. We put invitations on every single door, which made somebody think that one of us was pregnant, but it, that wasn't the case. Um, and then whoever wanted to show up, they came to this party. I came out to a whole dorm of people I knew for like two to three weeks. I was like, if you tell me you'll respect my pronouns, I'll give you a piece of this cake. It went great. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I love that. I thank you all for sharing. I know those are personal stories and sharing the highs. It's an amazing lows. story, Keaton. That's yeah. an awesome story. Awesome. That is so Thanks. <laughs> that is yeah. like one of those core memories that you'll have for life. I really love that. Um, and now I, I echo Susie's earlier comment. I have an 11 year old son and I ask him all the time, like, oh, you got any crushes? Like, are they girls? Are they boys? Like other? Like, um, you know, who, who do you crush on? I hear him and his fifth grade um, online class, like they share their pronouns. And so um, hopefully like more and more people will not even have to come out at all, um, that we won't be assumed straight. I know for me, I came, I'm 30 and I came out at like 26, so really late. Um, and it was like, oh, I'm going on a date and her name is this. And it was nothing like a, not a big conversation whatsoever. Um, and so hopefully we get more and more to that where it's not this stressful big ordeal that people are carrying with them. So with that, I think we are um, done for the night. And I really just want to thank the three amazing panelists that joined us out of their own time. Um, they're not obligated in any way, shape, or form to UNH anymore. So it's a huge deal that they're here and spend this evening with us. So um, feel free to unmute or give a reaction to sh show some love for um, these three amazing panelists, Kaden, Taylor, and Susie. Thank you all so, so, so much for sharing um, your experiences and your knowledge with us. It, it means so much that you're here. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Appreciate you guys listening. Thank you. I'm gonna and if anybody ever wants to contact me, please yeah. do, whether it's professional Same. or otherwise, more than happy to help. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to everyone who came. Thanks to Jordan for organizing this. And it's been a pleasure to chat with you all for this hour and a half. Um, and I hope you all have the great rest of your week. Have a good night. Bye. See you, everybody. Good luck, Susie, with the baby. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs>